over at the National Convention, judge the projects there or judge the applications that go in for the pre-screening to select the finalists that actually make the cut. Um, and you guys probably figured out if you look at results when they come out, Oklahoma has been really successful at the national level when they've gone on and gone forward. So for some of you in the room, I'm looking around going, I know you're agri-science people, I know you beat me at it. So, but part of this, we'll just kind of go through and visit with you about it. We've got some changes, obviously, that are coming in this year. All the stuff we'll talk about, just like the national chapter app and things will apply, these rules will apply from 2017 <coughs> through 2021. And there's been some pretty significant changes in it. The guts of it are still the same, just to talk plain English to you. But there's been some good changes and some yeah, changes. Big thing I want to talk about to begin with you guys, like Mr. Schatz kind of said, you know, science teachers, ag teachers, science, you know, it's all married together, kind of depending on focus. But the statement that you guys do agri science research projects on a daily basis, you guys do. Okay? Everybody's like, oh, yeah. yeah, you do. Just think about it a minute. You don't have to raise your hands, how many feet hogs? help students feed hogs, let me rephrase that. If you're trying to decide, does this hog feed work better for you versus this hog feed, you just did an agri-science project, okay? It can be that simple. Does a certain <coughs> breed of hogs finish out better on this pig feed versus that pig feed? That's an agri-science project. We'll go through a lot more examples. How many of you have ever shot a piece of metal from your shop that you've made with a certain primer and it didn't work? Kind of puddled up on you, didn't adhere to the metal real well? Had to go buy a different primer, right? You just did an agri science project. This one worked, this one did it. Guys, I'm boiling it real short and simple, okay? How many of your students do gardening, horticulture, grow plants, grow flowers? Something as simple as until I grew up in the hills and that's okay. We fertilized our tomato plants with chicken litter that came straight out of the chicken house. We had massive tomato plants. Chicken litter versus cow manure, does it make a difference? Okay? It's not rocket science. That's kind of where I want to start with you. You don't have to go, oh, well, I have to look at 19,000 different things and come up with all these wonderful specific answers. Guys, even at the national level and our state level, you walk in, the kids are asking one question. Okay, we're gonna talk about variables and controlling your variables in your project to where your results really answer one question. And that's the one question you ask. So that's why I throw some of these examples out in the beginning just to think about them. That it's a simple question. Do the research to get the answer you present it. That's all this is. Okay? Now, I've seen some at the national level that I went, yikes, I couldn't do that. You know, so I'm not going to tell you that they're all that simplistic. But certainly with your young kids, this is the way to get them started and hooked. Okay? One thing I found is once a kid starts an agri science research project with me, like a dog with a bone. They're the ones coming and going, okay, I've got an idea for next year. I've got an idea for next year. I want to do this. Can we tweak last year's, turn it into this? What can we do? Um, they, once they get a taste of it, they really, really like it. Okay? Even some of them, yes, there's an oral presentation part, which you guys all know that. And believe it or not, I've had some of mine that I just was hoping, hoping, hoping when it was time to stand up and talk, they did. And believe it or not, they could because they'd done the work, they did the project, and they understood it. So, it also, for some of our kids that we struggle for places to find them, to place to put them, or to categorize them, or get them in a specific SAE area, agri-science research fits right in there with these projects, okay? So, tell yourself, yes, I really do, okay? You do agri-science on a daily basis. <coughs> <coughs> Guys, if there's, a, yeah, there's quite a bit of stuff in this presentation, if you want it just to have, when you get back home, email me, I'll gladly email it to you, you can have it, I just want to print out a whole lot of them, 
<clears throat> but I have no problem sharing it with you. And basically what I did was take a lot of the rule changes, Jeremy did too, and kind of incorporate them so they're not in a whole lot of charts and things, but just to kind of let you look at it. I want to start off real quick with the scientific method. Okay, we're not back in science class, but this is something that I take my kids that are interested in it, and I sit down and go through the scientific method with them. Just so they know, it's kind of like the SMART goals that we were all just reminded about. If you take the scientific method and you answer each step in it, you're going to have a successful project. Okay? So looking at it, basically as the kids ask them a question, how, what, when, where, who, which, why, where, what's working? Okay? What isn't working? This interests me, this doesn't interest me. Okay? But they have to have a question. That's the starting point. Or we have to give them a question they might want to find an answer to. Okay? But it simply starts that path, or that easily, how does this work? Okay? If you guys, I know a lot of us, we're busy when the projects are up here and probably not a whole lot of you get to go through them. You might see the finalists or the state winners at convention, get to walk through that room and see them. <coughs> but if you look at them, there's a lot of them that are just asking, how does this work compared to this? Compare this fertilizer to this fertilizer. Compare this watering method to that watering method. Okay? But they're asking the question, which one works better? They start there. And guys, again, don't get over <coughs> with the words. But basically, science fair projects or some teachers require a question that you can measure. And to start off with, that's probably the best thing to kind of keep in mind is if you can measure it, it's easier to report on it. Which plant grew taller? Which breed of pig had the best feed efficiency or average daily gain on which feed you were feeding? That's something you can measure and you can get a number from, okay? When you get into some more of the objective ones where you're asking survey data questions and things like that, that gets a little harder to try to quantitate and come up with results that you got them. You can say, yeah, this me said yes, this me said no. But what did that really mean? So measure it. Like I said, examples here, grew bigger, change color, display the temperature change. <clears throat> you know, that's lots of different things. From mm, the one was on a refrigerator project, looking at the various different brands of refrigerators and actually what temperatures they stayed at inside them consistently over time in a barn. Okay? Again, was that rocket science? Let's put a thermometer in the refrigerator and open it up at the same time every day and see what the temperature was. But which brand held up outside in the heat longer? Okay? Fairly, fairly pretty simple on that one. Background research. This is one obviously I think we all know our kids sold up a little bit on. But in order to do a decent job at the project, in understanding what they're trying to do is they need to look into it just a little bit <clears throat> in terms of what questions can I ask if I do a project like this. Let's go back to the feeding the hogs question, okay? If I feed this set of pigs this, this set of pigs this. Well, number one, first of all, are they all crossbreds? Are they all Durocs? Are they all Yorks? How do my groups look? Everybody follow me on that one? Because if your groups are completely different, the science behind that song will be real good, right? Because you're carrying way too many variables in it. You have a pin of Durox and a pin of Yorks, or two pins of Durox, you feed one set this feed, one set that feed, this set this feed. You can look at average daily gain, you can look at feed efficiency, you can look at days to, you know, 285, whatever you want to look at in growth rate comparisons. But you need to get, the kids need to understand what questions they're gonna ask in the end. One of the biggest mistakes a kid can make is doing the project and then trying to figure out what they were doing. Does that make sense? I've got these results, I've got these numbers. What did I really do? What did I really ask? So if they know what they're asking, going into it, then it's real easy to write it up, come to your conclusions, 
can figure out what you're doing. Okay? Starting from scratch, you know, guys, there's nothing wrong with honestly going to a science fair, even if it's not an ag science fair. Go to the school science fair, go to a regional science fair, state science fair, go online. They can YouTube a million different science fair things. Look at them. We all, in the game, if you play this game, you look at a project and go, hmm, I can tweak or change this, this, or this, and I have a whole new project for a kid. Okay? So don't be afraid to look at other projects and look at them and think about what can be <coughs> different, what can I repeat, because if you repeat the exact same project, you know, obviously you might get a little bit of trouble for that one if you get caught, but just as long as you tweak something about it, it's all right. Okay? But ask the questions. Find out if somebody <coughs> did other research like this in the past. Did it work? Did it not work? Okay? Look at hogs. They may have compared this food and that food. Well, they didn't get good results. So if I'm going to do that one, I may change the two feed types and see if I get something. Okay? And you can do it with chickens, cattle, anything. Growth data. Okay? But rather than starting it from scratch, look at what's out there. You can look, <coughs> OSU's a great place to come and steal ideas. Remember all those research posters that they had pinned on the walls that we never really looked at when we walked through the buildings? You're like, okay, fine, they're just things on the walls. Guys, free fodder, walk through there, look at their projects. Are most of them way too advanced for what we need to do? Most of them, but there's ideas. I saw one just the other day on fish in different lakes and rivers looking at populations. Okay? How did they get to it? They went out and fished a whole day. How many fish did they catch in different areas of the lake? Measuring weights and stuff. So, could we modify that one down? You know, looking at the type of fish caught on a cloudy day versus the type of fish caught on a sunny day using the exact same lure. Got anybody that might like to go fishing for an agri-science project? That's a pretty easy one, guys. Okay? Did they ask a question? Does this lure work better on a sunny day or a cloudy day? If they caught no fish any time, I need that have to go fishing again. You know. So there's some simple things like that to think about. But just look and see what's done. Construct a hypothesis, short version of this. Okay? A lot of kids want to get hung up on this and think they have to come up with something fancy. It's not. If I water these plants with this fertilizer, they're going to grow taller. That's my hypothesis. That's what I think. If I feed brand X to my lambs, they will have a higher average daily gain. Okay? If I use a bright orange lure on a sunny day, I will catch more fish. Ask a question, form the hypothesis. The biggest mistake a lot of people make about this is once they've made the hypothesis statement, guys, if you get the hypothesis statement wrong, you didn't fail. You answered the question. And that's one of the biggest things that I have to struggle with a little bit with the kids. Our shut my experiment didn't work. No, it worked. We got results. Were they what we wanted or what we thought? No, but did your experiment fail? No, it didn't. Okay, we got stuff, we can take it, we can learn from it. So you just come up with that hypothesis. <clears throat> A simple one, and guys, I know most of us have blocked the scientific method out, that's okay. But a good hypothesis allows you to then make a prediction. If, that blank you said, if I do this, then this will happen. This is the easiest way I've been able to explain it to kids. If I use this fertilizer, then my plants will grow bigger. That's the hypothesis statement. Okay? And these are, again, like I said, kind of like the SMART goals for these. You answer these questions, then when Jeremy gets to talk about the fun application that you get to download now from the national site and put everything in there, you will have information for each one of those blanks to put in it <coughs> if you'll follow this method. Mm -hmm. And guys, I should have told you earlier in the beginning, stop me anytime if you have questions. Best thing I can say is I have no train of thought, so you'll not derail me. You won't mess me up. So ask any questions anytime as we go through. 
bottom in your sense, state both your hypothesis and the resulting prediction you will be testing. Predictions must be easy to measure. Is weight gain easy to measure? We run them across the scale, right? Is growth of a plant easy to measure? Okay, is that easy? It is. Is meat stored in the freezer for X number of months? You take it out, did it spoil? Was it in a Ziploc bag? Was it in a food sealer preservative bag? Was it wrapped at the butcher? How long do they last in the freezer before the meat turns bad? Easily measurable. And again, nothing real difficult about talking about them <coughs> or trying to figure it out. The one the meat's in the freezer, guys, you think about that. It goes in foods and food processing. We'll talk about the categories and the divisions in just a second. Um, you know, that's one, if we all raised our hand right now in the room, which method do you think preserves it best in the freezer? Leave it wrapped from the butcher, grocery store, go home and put it in a Ziploc freezer bag, go home and do it. You have one of those home food saver things, you suck all the air out and put it in the freezer. You guys probably all have an opinion on which you think would last better, right? Could a kid do that pretty easy? You don't have to have 700 pounds of meat. You can go buy five pounds of hamburger and stick it in the freezer and do a research project. That simple, that fast. You want to go a step beyond with that one? You take it out, culture it for bacteria. Swab it, put it on a petri dish, let it grow. See what type of bacteria you get off of it after it's been in the freezer for that time period. Hopefully not much, but you never know, right? So. Ask the question, but make sure that your research that you do will actually get you the <coughs> an answer to that question. Testing the hypothesis is really doing the work, okay? Whether or not <coughs> it's a project that lasts a day, or in the case of some of us that <coughs> play in the plant systems world, our projects are sometimes six, seven, eight months in length in growing plants and doing research on them. But it can be as short as a day, it can be as short as 30 minutes. I've seen some projects, I know Mr. Schmidt has too, that in foods processing and some different things, kids are looking at a fresh vegetable versus a frozen vegetable, grinding them up with a simple test kit, looking at nutrients that come out of the ground up products, fresh versus frozen, okay? Is that going to take more than 30 minutes? Probably not. Grind them up, run them through your tester and see, okay? Pretty simple, but do the work. Big thing to you, kind of like all of us, is planning, sitting down, looking at your deadlines, going backwards, and saying, okay, whatever I do, I have to be done with the research you know, depending on how fast you and the student can get things pulled together, usually about 30 days before the applications do, to give you a time to do writing, the app, the editing, and getting it fixed. Okay? But so this part, testing your hypothesis, I mean, honestly, I'll tell you right now, I've already got plants that are on research trials right now that will be coming off in early, middle of late March, but we started them in November. So. But those are long projects that we know we have to go back and get them started early, okay? But testing them, it doesn't have to be a six month project. It doesn't have to be a day long project. It just has to be a project that answers a question. Either answers it good or answers it bad. I love the fishing one. Feel free to use it because I've got boys that will just, you know, hate the fact that they have to go fish all day Saturday and see which lure works best, okay? One I saw was which deer supplement was the word that was used attracted larger bucks. <coughs> what did they do? They looked at wildlife cameras. Use this kind of feed at one plot and this kind of feed at one plot. You can't feed deer in the state that came from, so it was a supplement. So we all know what they were doing. But again, how hard was that? Put out the deer feed, check your camera, collect your data, there you go. Okay? 
Basically, this test says it's important for your experiment to be a fair test. You conduct a fair test by making sure that you change only one factor at a time while keeping all other conditions the same as much as you can. This is kind of what I won't say is the make or break of a truly very successful agri-science project, but it's the key to any successful project. If you do a trial or research project, you need to, again, control as many variables as you can. For example, in my plant projects, they're grown in the same grow tables, the temperature's the same, the humidity is the same, everything's the same except one variable that we're testing. So whatever my results are, temperature had no role in it, sunlight had no role in it, growth medium had no role in it. The one variable, whether I used fertilize or which type I used, that was the question we were asking. Which fertilize did this? If you've seen any of my projects, again, what are my feelings if you haven't, but if you've seen them, that's one of the ones that we look at a lot of, different NPK ratios, but growing different types of petunias under different conditions and situations. So, sounds like there's a whole lot of stuff in it when you read the title. When you boil it down, my kid asked one question. Which fertilizer produced the most blooms on this petunia plant? That's all it did, okay? That's kind of how you need to get yourself to go back to my hog example I was using. If I have a pen that I want to feed a certain feed and another pen I want to see feed another feed, if this is a pen of multiple different breeds and this is a pen of multiple different breeds, have I already introduced a million variables that are going to be hard to control? I did, okay? If these are all Yorks and these are all Yorks, I've just rallied in the troops, if you will. Now, gilts and barrows, gilts and barrows, mixes, it's okay. Is it better if it's gilts and gilts or barrows and barrows? That's better, because you're taking variables out and narrowing it down to one question. That project could basically see the response of your gilts to XYZ feed versus XYZ. I wouldn't use the names. <laughs> I might use nutrient content to identify my different treatments. Okay? And a lot of times, believe it or not, guys, if you go to your feed reps, you go to a feed dealer, depending on where you live, they love field tests like that. You might even get the feed donated so your kids aren't even having to pay for it. What a better way to feed out a project, right? Here you go, here you go. You'd be surprised what they'll do if you tell them, I'm conducting a little research trial. <coughs> because, you guys have all read the ads, you know, we may not be huge tea anchor farm, but little on-site research projects they love to be able to have that's showing a difference in their feed, okay? The thing here, if you have the ability, it says you should repeat your experiment several times to make sure that the first results were an accident. <coughs> well, number one, most of us don't have time to do that. Okay? But <coughs> the way you can help yourself around this one, guys, and we all have the class at school, we either blocked it out or don't want to think about it again, but that little piece of statistics we talked about, the N, or the number of items in a treatment. The larger your number, the more powerful your project, okay? So if you have five hogs on feed and five hogs on feed, good project, that's a decent number to have. If you can put 25 and 25, that's even better, okay? Because the larger the number, that takes care of what's called individual variation. You guys remember that? Everything's different. If we only have one or two, it's full of a lot of individual bias. If we have a bunch of them, then that individual bias is going out. For example, in my plant project, we'll have at least 100 plants per five treatments. So there's one kid's responsible for 500 petunia plants. But that takes 
that individual variation out. And when we get an average growth for that one treatment, that is truly pretty representative of that treatment, okay? So that's hard sometimes when you're like, I oh, only have five pigs. Five pigs is okay, guys, do it. You have any questions on that one? Don't go to sleep, okay? Analyze your data and draw a conclusion. <coughs> Once your experiment's complete, collect your measurements, analyze them, support your hypothesis, yes or no. We'll talk a little bit about this. <coughs> As agri-science does continue to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger, a lot of you will see that more and more of us, even at the state level, uh, are doing statistical analysis on our data. Is it mandatory? No. Okay. Is it beneficial? Yes. Good news. Right or wrong now, guys, you can run statistics in Excel spreadsheets. Okay, there's a function in there that says data analysis. So you don't have to know somebody at the university. You don't have to know somebody that works somewhere. You don't have to go to the mainframe. Mr. Stats and I remember when you had to punch holes in cards way back then to try to do data analysis. Now we don't have to anymore. Guys, the biggest part here on analyzing your data that I want you to kind of hopefully understand this comes from a judging standpoint and then also a teaching standpoint. But the big thing we have to make our students understand is if you don't have statistics, it's fine. But you really can't say this treatment was better than that treatment. You can say it grew taller. You can say it gained more weight. It had a numerically greater value. But unless you run statistics on it, or you can, and guys don't flash back and start having seizures, but where you can say P less than 0.05, this was significantly different than that one, then you really just have to say, this one grew bigger, this one was shorter, this one had more circumference, more fish but this lure that day, okay? But even at the national levels, I've seen that a kid with no statistics will stand there and say, this is a better one. Why? Well, because it is. Well, you know, tell me why, how can you make that statement? Just because the numbers are different doesn't mean that it's better. Okay? So don't let that dissuade you guys, but as you move through the process, going from state, hopefully going on to the national level, there's enough of us around that can help you with it but we need to get you some statistics incorporated into it, certainly as you go on to the national level, because you don't have to, but it sure helps. Can I throw in real please, quick? Please, please. You don't remember your statistics class or you took it in junior college like I did, and that was real great. Um, statistics for dummies is smaller than our current handbook, and that will give you more statistics knowledge than you need in the paper. Yeah. If you go beyond that book, the kid doesn't understand it and they can't explain it. The statistics for dummies is like teeny <coughs> tiny, smaller than our manual. I would highly suggest. And all my kids that have made it to the national level. It's three bucks, well five. With their statistics in their projects, they had to explain how they ran them on the laptops. And if they go through statistics for dummies, that's why I said, and there's enough of us here that have done this we can help launch you in the right direction. And a lot of you that have done science fair, I see you in here, you know you're here. Thank you, Tanya. Please jump in at any time, okay? So, but I just want to throw that out because that's, that's kind of a big thing that the, I didn't judge this year, but the year before, that a lot of the judges would come back. I'm not supposed to talk about projects, y'all know that, but you come back from judging and they're like, well, that's a great project, but that kid had no statistics and was just thinking this thing was the neatest thing in the world. The rubric was not marked real high. Okay? So these are things to kind of help you build as you go through. Um, I'm not going to bore y'all with that big one. I thought it was good when I wrote it, but who knows? Um, well, as y'all missed that one, all it basically said there was a re emphasis of when you analyze your data, Guys, you have to stress to the kids, no experiment is a failure. 
Okay? Because a no answer is just as valuable as a yes answer. This fertilizer is going to grow them better. Whoops, it didn't. Is that a failure? No. It answered the question. It didn't grow it better. So now you know. Last one here starts this basically the analyzing the data starts the process and scientific method over again. You find an answer. <clears throat> you look at the answer. Did it support your hypothesis? No. Who cares? You write it up that way. That it did not turn out like I thought. There's tons of research that doesn't turn out like people thought. A lot of times if you have time, you can tweak it and try it again, but yeah, just report your results, okay? Last thing here, kind of communicate your results. You guys, I think, know this, but in agri science fair projects here, they'll need to be reported in a final report and on a display board. I think Jeremy will touch on this, but this year, even at the state level, we're going to have to submit our reports through AET, basically, and upload that format into AET, upload it, and then Mr. Wayne can download it all from AET. All of our reports will have to go in that way. That's the only way you can submit them this year. So if you haven't found the link yet, <clears throat> go in there because you'll have to go into a student, go to the report section, generate an agri-science report. Once you generate it, click on it, and then you can start editing just like any of our other applications. But that's something make sure you're aware of. I think Jeremy's going to touch on it a little bit more. <coughs> the thing I stress to my kids, that professional scientists do the exact same thing we're doing in the classroom. That's how they discovered penicillin. That's how they discovered a lot of things, trying different things to come up with an answer. Okay? There we go. All right, something a little more of you might be interested in a little more as we go. These are the categories or divisions um, that this really has not changed. They tweaked on environmental services and natural resources a little bit. I'm going to take you through these steps of kind of what the description for each one of them is. Point out a few things because one of the biggest things we can mess up is entering a project in the wrong category. Okay? Hopefully it gets caught enough early enough in your application process that they can say, hey, you thought this was animal systems. It really goes in foods. And they swap you over. Because the worst thing that can happen is you get up here, set your board up for state, they go to and disqualify you. Okay? Sadly, not just us, but other states send stuff on to nationals. And nationals will disqualify something, even though it came out of a state as their state winner. If it does not fit within the national scope guideline of a category, guys, they don't even blink an eye. They just throw it in a book. <coughs> okay? So the first step is getting in the right division and making sure you're there. Animal systems. You guys, this is like, if you can get this from me, you can go to the national site and pull it up. With animal systems, including life processes, health, nutrition, genetics, management, processing, through the study of small animals, aquaculture, livestock, dairy, horses, and or poultry. Obviously, that covers lots of stuff, right? But the key to it is it's animal systems, including those things right there. Some examples I'll give you. But again, I pulled from nationals. I'm not trying to recreate the wheel. But you have to make sure the question you're asking and the answer that you will receive, hopefully, comes under these guidelines. Compare nutrient levels on animal growth. That kind of goes back to the pig thing I've been talking about lots. That certainly is animal system. <clears throat> Research new disease control mechanisms. Okay? One of the ones you guys are probably a little more familiar with human-wise is the flu shot versus the flu mist up your nose. You might try to get the flu mist up your nose this year. It's not here this year, is it? In Oklahoma. You get the flu shot. They decided that wasn't as effective. So they tested us. We were guinea pigs. We tested it out. We still got sick. It's gone. 
Effects of extra synchronization on ovulation. Again, an example. Is this a little more complicated project to try to, to synchronize all your cattle or your swine or something like that? It is, but is it something a kid can do? Yeah. Compare the effects of thawing inhibitors on livestock semen. I like how they threw that one in. This was a kid from Texas that had done a four-year project and ended up being the national champion in the team division of animal systems. The only reason I know is he's my next door neighbor in Texas when I lived there before I moved up here. But they ran a sheep herd at their house and they basically froze and stored semen, sold it for their business, and they looked at different techniques over a four year period and kind of came up with what they thought the best extender was, what the best temperature was, and this kid knew his stuff when he got there. So, but you can do that. Affects the growth hormone on meat or milk production. You know, that might be a little more sensitive. Again, not my ideas, these came from nationals, but something for you to think about. Big thing, think in this category, it's really kind of about animal response. We do something and look for a response within that animal's growth, performance, reproductive efficiency, almost biological is a response that they're looking for within animal systems, is how it's kind of been explained to us. Environmental services, natural resource systems, uh, at one time this was split out, I think in 12 or 11, maybe they put them together. If you look in the National Handbook, there's a little asterisk, asterisk that says they're still combined. However, in the future they might be split out. Because you can be looking at some very different apples and oranges when you combine natural resources and environmental, depending on which direction they went. With the environmental part, the studies of systems, instruments, technology used to monitor and minimize the impact of human activity on the environmental system. Again, wide open, looking at different things. <clears throat> I've seen projects at the National that were looking at the effect of some dam that they put on a river and the number or specific type of fish that were found on the other side of the dam. Okay, obviously the student didn't build the dam, but somebody did. There's a lot of ways to look at that, and I'll show you some examples. Natural resource systems, again, the management, protection, enhancement, and improvement of soil, water, wildlife, forests, and air is a natural resource. So there's a lot of ways you can go there. Some people, guys, a lot of this will kind of tie into the energy component and Devon Energy, which has been a big supporter of the project. Um, a lot of sites now are cleaning up old oil wells. They're doing different things. They're trying to look at soil purification, trying to get some of the fossil fuel residue out of it, cleaning up some of the oil spillage. Obviously, there's ERV that does it statewide, but there's some different things that kids could look at in that process. You know, that certainly, I'll just throw them a plug right now because they've been good to us, but you win the Devon thing, guys, that's a thousand bucks scholarship for your kid. You know, when my kid won it the first year they had it, we barely knew how anybody else placed. We were freaking out so much over that one. We're like, oh, you placed too? Oh, great, good. You know, so that's a pretty big deal. So, and all the project does just has to relate to energy in some form or fashion, okay? A lot of these in natural resources and environmental sciences both can tie big time into it. Um, so look there, here's some examples. Jeremy, don't let me take up all your time. No, I'm not. Can we go a little bit. Good. All right. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> all right. Effective agricultural chemicals on water quality. This was an Oklahoma kid project from several years ago. Do y'all remember it? He was on, you click on AgriScience Example. This is the boy from Western Oklahoma, and I don't remember his name but went around and took water samples from various streams and ponds around different farming operations and analyzed that runoff water, basically that was collecting in the <coughs> sloughs or the ponds and looked at nutrient chemicals in it and see, you know, basically found out there was a whole lot more running off in the ponds than Grandpa knew, okay? Was that a bad thing? Hopefully the EPA didn't come see them after the report, but it was a neat project, and I also, when I talked to the boy, and I'm sorry I don't remember his name, uh, you know, he said it was kind of an eye-opener for a lot of people in the area. They didn't realize quite as much was running off. So, 
and not to simplify that project, but that boy went out and took water samples, shipped them to OSU and had them analyzed in the water quality lab. They shipped him the results back and he had his agri-science project done. Okay? Good project. He didn't, do, didn't have to do a lot of weird things with it. The effect of cropping practices, that's not my word, I lifted it straight from nationals, but anyway, on wildlife populations, okay? You guys all have a lot of kids that like to hunt. They can look at their normal areas they go, look at what's happening around it, whether it's crops, whether it's housing developments, things being put in close to the areas they go to, and making observations about how they think the wildlife population has changed. The last one there, compare water movements through different soil types. A lot of you guys have probably seen this even in the third grade level. They're pouring water through clay. Does it drain very well? They pour it through silt. You kind of have to go a little step further than that, but it's for your younger kids, your eighth graders. It is a really good thing to start out with if they're interested in water quality and things because they're just running water through soil and seeing how much soil is actually eroding. Okay, so that's a good example there. Food products and processing. <clears throat> study this one pretty hard because it's the study of product development, <clears throat> quality assurance, food safety, production, regulation, and compliance, <coughs> and food service within the science industry. This doesn't just mean you make cookies or you make cupcakes. Can that fit into there? Yes. Okay. But you kind of have to look at the wording. Food safety, production, <coughs> compliance with food service, <coughs> and the science, the food science industry as a whole. Guys, this is where a lot of meats projects, most of you have, probably you took meats. At least meats one probably when you were here in school. But a lot of things in this, guys, you can look at, again, the presence or lack of bacteria, the presence or absence of E. coli, how long you cook a steak, how well, you cook it medium, you cook it rare. You can swab these things, grow them on petri dishes. You don't have to have fancy equipment. You can build an incubator with a light bulb and three pieces of, four pieces of plywood, okay? Grow your cultures. You may not know how to count them yet, but YouTube has that answer too, like it has everything else, okay? But meat projects go in here. Food processing, making beef jerky different I mean, we all have your own dehydrators at home. Kids have them everywhere. Venison jerky versus beef jerky. Cook them the same length. Is one more tender than the other? Okay? Too much cayenne. Did I use meat tenderizer before I dried it out? I'm just throwing lots of crazy things out there. Things we're already doing at home. Okay? Yes? Did y'all ever get a straight answer from National play on like the consumer preference of some of that stuff? If that's food science, if it doesn't social? That's a good question. The question was, did we ever get a definitive answer <laughs> on food science? Basically, if you do something and have a taste panel, basically, they try this one versus this one versus that one. They answer a survey. This one was more moist. This one was more tender, X, Y, Z. <clears throat> if the majority of the project is about the... And it was my project. So the cupcakes that were made with guar gum, xanthan gum, different things, gluten free. The focus of the project truly really was on the cooking process and substitution of gluten flour. Since that was the focus of the project and the response was just this one was more moist or XYZ, that one actually went in food systems. If the biggest majority of that project had been more about the survey data, then they would have bumped us down to social. Anytime, and I appreciate the question from Jared, and Jenna, again, Ignata said, I love Jenna, call her up, email her, here's what I'm doing, does it fit here? She's like, let me check, I'll get back to you. Eh, Brett, you better take a left turn on that one. No, it's not going in that category. But she will get back to you very quick if you have a question. Because the social system and the survey data was a big point big big about two years ago and they'll they'll answer it you know pretty quickly their first response will be most cumulative data from a survey we're going to want you to go in social unless you can really prove that it fits in another one better okay
Okay. Uh, food products going on the resistance, resistance of organic fruits to common diseases, chemical energy stored in foods. Guys, a lot of these things, you're looking at that going, I barely survived Cowboy Organic. I am not going back. <coughs> a lot of these things, guys, you can go to food stores and buy chemical kits that you use drops and dyes and indicators that based on a color change, it's called color metric change, will tell you starch content, it'll give you an estimate of energy content. You're not having to use all that huge massive equipment anymore. For science fair, this will get you there. Now if you're going to the nationals, you might want to buddy up with somebody up here and say, can we please come to your lab and use your bottom calorimeter? But for the most part, you can do it at home. Control of molds on bakery products. This was a national project, I think, three years ago. Basically, they sent out loaves of bread they bought from the store, which molded fast, which lasted the longest, and then looked at the ingredient lists in them, okay, to see what was different that might have changed the mold rate. Not rocket science, right? Which one turned green fastest? Okay, moving on down. Jeremy's going to talk about the triangle test in just a second after I shut up in a minute. And the amount of sucrose used in baked goods. Different things, but it'll work. Oh, why is the same repeating? Plant systems, <clears throat> study of plant life. Guys, the biggest thing I'll stress about this, you can do almost anything in the world of plants in plant systems. Okay? Big thing is, <coughs> is you're not really looking at the nutrient composition or the food part of plants per se in plant science. Because if you look at it, plant life cycles, classification, function, structures, reproduction, median nutrients, growth, culture, through the city of crops, turf grass, trees, shrubs, ornamentals, whatever. There's nothing in there about this corn has more sugar in it because we use this fertilizer on it. Okay? Something like that, you might want to ask nationals, call one of us. That's one of those projects that probably needs to slide into foods because you're looking at a nutrition aspect of it, not just the plant growth, okay? Examples, short and sweet, transpiration in plants. Guys, a lot of these, our own little CIMC curriculum tells you how to go look at transpiration plants, tells you how to take scotch tape and tape over the stomata and see what it'll do different. A lot of these things you can pull right out of there. Heavy metals on edible plants, GMOs versus conventional seeding, lunar climate, the length of the moon cycle and all that and soil conditions, plant growth, hydroponics versus conventional methods. Lots of different things, guys. Simply, simply, simply put, for your younger kids even, this is, you know, the petunia set in the windowsill for six hours a day versus they sit in the windowsill for eight hours a day. Which one grew better? Okay? You gotta remember to water them. It's about the biggest thing they have to do on that one and measure them. Simple things. I plant reddish seeds in a nice loamy soil versus a sandy clay. Which soil type produced better radishes? Okay? I'm not talking about how the radishes taste, but how many more grew and what was the size of them. So, simple things. You guys in western Oklahoma that farm a whole lot, it's real simple. You get grandpa to mark them off a little square area and have a test plot there. They can change soil type, they can use different fertilization, then they can use the rest of the field as the comparison or non-treatment or control group to look at their plants they planted in the little test plot. And we all know if a grandkid asks grandpa, he's not gonna say no, he'll give them a test plot. Y'all know that, okay? Let's look at this one and I'm close to bailing and it's Jeremy's turn. <laughs> this is a big difference, okay, change in the new rule book compared to years past where we didn't have six divisions this coming year, we'll have basically, if you look by the white and the yellow and the white, those are grade levels specific. <coughs> Division one is individuals in seventh and eighth. Division two is teams of two in seventh and eighth. And then three and four is individuals in nine and 10. 
and then teams of two in nine and ten. Okay, and they're very specific teams of two, not teams of four, five, six, or eight. It's teams of two. And then division five is, <coughs> excuse me, individuals 11 and 12, and then teams of two, 11 and 12. Jeremy will cover the rubric because the division seven and eight, the rubric's different, they're scored different. The expectation is obviously a little bit lower because they are younger age, so they're actually looked at differently where they were not in the past when it was 8, 9, 10. It was a little bit different there. Okay? In the team's division, the two, mm -hmm. does each child have to specifically have tasks that they complete themselves or is it a group effort? In my opinion, and I've never read anything different, it's basically a group effort. Uh, now, when my teams, usually, they're there together all the time doing the work. One may be gone to a show and the other one's doing the work, but I don't split them up. I basically, that way they both know the entire project from beginning to end. And when it comes time to the presentation, the biggest thing I'd say about your teams, just to kind of help you from a judging standpoint, it's real easy, and y'all all know this, it's real easy to tell when you're standing there talking to a team and there's one kid that did all the work and they drug their friend along so they could be in team, not individual. Both those kids need to participate in the presentation. I didn't, did I, Josh? In the presentation and be able to answer the questions back and forth. Um, where did social go? Well, I don't know what happened to that one. I skipped completely over social systems. I don't know, it was in there, but whatever. Social systems is the other category. Maybe it was a Freudian I hit it and didn't want to talk about it, right? Social systems, guys, not to oversimplify it by any means, um, but a lot of, I've had projects in social systems, Mr. Schmidt's had national winners in social systems. Uh, a lot of those projects are survey data driven. And it's kind of the crux, it's not melted down into where it has to be specific this, 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 or that. But a lot of you guys have had your students call around asking different questions in different chapters. A lot of you responded to my emails. If you remember the fracking one a few years ago, we sent out emails to you guys asking you to respond about that. Basically survey data that you're taking based kind of almost on anything really fits in the social, <coughs> social sciences or social systems, <coughs> excuse me, division. Um, sometimes it's a real, I don't want to say easy place for kids to start, but it is in a way, because you can survey your classroom, and you've got a survey set right there of you know, 20, 25 kids. You know, do you prefer this over that? Probably want to ask a few more questions than that, but you know, do you think the FFA jacket is freezing cold in the winter versus moderately warm? You know, they all have an opinion on that. Versus the project of mine that I alluded to was looking at fracking and waste wastewater disposal methods, which was a little controversial, but Devin loved it. She won the scholarship, okay? Her survey basically was looking at, had you been affected, what was in your area? Her big question was, do you think, and when she just asked it, do you think saltwater injection is causing earthquakes? And at that point in time, 67% of the Oklahomans that responded thought it was. So. Again, all she did was develop the survey. We sent it out through SurveyMonkey. People respond. You can get a lot of responses very quick. Okay? If you use SurveyMonkey, I don't lie, it summarizes your data for you. Okay? But you don't have to do anything that big. Something as simple as surveying your school. They can go in and find out. I've, you know, I'll tell you an idea. If you steal it, then it's my bad. I had a student come in my class mad, mad, mad the other day. Everybody throws their apples away. Talking about the lunchroom. I said, what? She's like, there's apples in the floor. There's apples in the hallway. There's apples in the trash can. She goes, I wonder how many apples are thrown away in a day. I said, there's a good ag science project. You're going to get to monitor the cafeteria. And she's like, 
Why am I going to do that? Because it makes me angry. I'm like, okay. So, <coughs> call it dumb, call it simple. She'll know how many apples were served in a day. And hopefully by the end of the day, she'll know how many apples were thrown away. I don't know if she's going to watch anybody consume them. But basically, if she sees them thrown on the ground or thrown in the trash can, she'll basically know and to go to the cafeteria people with it and say, listen, 85% of your apples are being thrown away. So call it what you want, but basically that's a survey type data project too, okay? Last thing I'm gonna talk about, <clears throat> guys, this is very strict and very stringent, board size, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. The board can only be three feet tall, 48 inches wide, which is real simple, basically it's a three by four sheet, okay? If you still wanna use the traditional trifolds, okay they can only be 30 inches in depth most people now have moved to just a plain three by four flat board that we stand up on an easel okay we're having them printed in print shops um, love it hate it whatever you want to call it that's where the project has gone to okay so to and i would say you can't be competitive without one of the other displays but you will look a little bit different okay again you'd be surprised there are companies I happy to share them with you if you're ever wanting to look mr. Schmidt may too a lot of you probably have I even know Kinko's a lot of places like that if you take them your project board on a jump drive or thumb drive give it to them they'll actually print it you know depending on what kind of board you want it on you can print them in town I'm a type of lot. I have a company in California that prints mine and ships them to me. It's cheaper than anywhere in town. I can get it done from California. They can get them to me in a day. So just depends on what you want to do or how you want to do it. Don't let that stop any kid from doing a project. If they want to do the old trifold that they're used to doing from little middle school or even younger than that, let them start that way. If they do a good job, it'll be graded fairly. You know, they're not going to get a, oh, well, they didn't use the fancy board. It'll get graded right. They will just notice that the majority of them now do look different. Okay? Last thing here, Jeremy will talk a little bit more about it. This is optional, a logbook. In my chapter, the logbook is not optional. Okay? You write down everything you do every day. Okay? You've got a scientific log journal. When we come to state, when we go to nationals, if we make it, there are multiple copies for the judges to look at as they go through. Big thing here, guys, make sure your kids know this. No additional props. <coughs> Handouts or electronics will be permitted. Now, if you're in the mechanical division, okay, power and structure, I guess I left that one out too. I need that, Jeremy. Um, <laughs> There's going to be some electricity used there. That's a little different category. Okay, they may be generating electricity. But you basically, any other display board, you're not going to plug it in with flashing lights or neon or anything like that. It's pretty straightforward and plain. <clears throat> Last there, no electricity will be provided. So if you need it, you're out of luck. Okay? With that, I'm going to get out of the way. I'll be over here if you have a question. Yes, sir? Uh, on the log book, have you used the journal? In AET, can that work as a log book? Like journaling stuff? Uh, <laughs> I it think it could. I mean, uh, if it looked good enough, is it? Don't uh, tell the Texas boys, but no, I don't like it to incorporate into the Ag Science Report. Um, it's, my Ag Science kids log it in there, <coughs> but they also basically. Do I'm a a they have a written log and it has to be typed up and everything has to go in it like that and we format it a specific way and stuff like that i mean would it work yes would i recommend it probably not okay. but it will work because it basically if you keep a daily log and guys i'll be honest with you that's probably one of the biggest things that i've seen the kids don't do is keep a log of what they're doing okay and again we don't want to flash back to science class for some of y'all because it does make some of y'all shudder but science basically is about records and data logging and keeping track 
of exactly what you do. So if it does mess up, hopefully you can go back and figure out where it messed up. But first thing I'll leave you with, and I'll let Mr. Jeremy do a better job than I did, hopefully, is don't be afraid of this project area, okay? It is simple. You guys do these projects every day. If you just stop and ask yourself. One good example is literally, does my truck get better gas mileage on ethanol or ethanol free? How hard is that for a kid? Write down his mileage, fill his truck up, make notes of when he was hot rodding and burning rubber and all that kind of stuff versus driving normally. There's a science for a project, guys. Okay? Jeremy, take over. Y'all think of something I'm here asking? My email is B R E S C O T T at shawnee.k12.ok.us. If anybody wants this, just shoot me an email. I'll be happy to send it to you. It's shawnee.k12.ok.us. Brad, if you'd add those other two categories, not be selfish. <laughs> no, we'll put we'll archive them and put them on there. If you want to, we'll just put them on the website. A teacher can go to them and find them if you want to. So instead of always hitting you, they can just go there and look at them. I will. I just don't know. That's weird. You just weren't social enough when this I happened. I was not social enough, I guess. So. Well, and the categories are also the second page of the, the form I handed out to you. So there's another. It doesn't have the descriptions, but it does, uh, it does at least give you the category areas. Um, on this, uh, one of the things that we're going through this year is, like everything else, we're going through a major change in rules. And uh, I know that I had a student about five years ago that did the first science project. I didn't know what it was. Uh, she came up to me and just said, I want to do this. I said, well, I guess if you want to put it all together, bring it to me. I'll see what we can do. And as soon as she went to the state contest and, and qualified for nationals, I all of a sudden got excited. I said, okay, well, I guess we figure out what this is. So it's come a long ways. First year at nationals was uh, pretty rough. We saw a lot of simple stuff. Uh, it is continuing to get better and better. Uh, they're getting better people in charge of it at nationals. Uh, I know the individual, the head man right now, is really passionate about it. He's trying to make it easier, try to make it more, uh, I guess, a little bit simpler for ag teachers to kind of handle. Um, and that's what I'm here to talk about is kind of the rubric and how we're going to get around that. There are some major changes. The triangle test in sensory science is now allowed in food science. Three years ago, I went to judge at nationals, and in that particular three-day period or whatever, we read 150 reports and judged 150 reports at my table, and they averaged approximately 15 to 20 pages long per report. Uh, it was extremely extensive, but unfortunately, my first time to judge, I got food science, and we kicked out a third of the applications. Immediately were disqualified because at that time, the perspective was is that we were not going to allow any type of survey data in there. They considered sensory information. Is this crunchier? Does this taste better? Does this look better? They considered that to be a survey piece of information. And so that should have been social systems. Even though the year before that, our student that qualified for nationals, her science project was how do crickets taste? Um, covered with chocolate, that's what she ate. So there's always evolution that's going to occur. But now they've been able to say, definitely, this information, if it is sensory data, and it's designed to improve or develop a food product, then it does belong in the food systems category. But I take it one step farther. If you're going to try that for the first year this year, and you've never done a science fair project before, and you want to do one start this year, and you're going to go with that direction, because it's pretty easy to do, and it's also kind of fun. Make sure you put together the abstract, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Attach it, send it to Jenna Jensen. She will forward it to the head man. He will send back an <coughs> OK, yay or nay, and then you are covered 100%. When it goes to nationals and you get those three judges sitting there and that previous judge was kicked out two years ago, 
and wants the same thing to happen again, well, you've got that email, they have that email and say, no, this has been okay, this is okay to go. Um, so that's one thing that's changed. Uh, they split up the divisions. They, uh, they really, they were seeing the fact that some, some states have seventh graders, and they were seriously getting left behind by the ninth graders. We had the two divisional systems. The rubric is completely different for the younger kids. It's much easier now. Um, but they had divided that up. So now we'll have eighth graders competing on their own, and then the other two age divisions after that. To help with the number of people that are there, because that after science contest at Nationals is huge, they have went from 15 down to 12 people making it to Nationals. Now I'm going to tell you this, there's no reason why Oklahoma judged three times every single application that goes to Nationals from Oklahoma should be a top 12. There's no reason why it shouldn't be. Really, as you judge them right now, they're about five, six, seven deep in each category. Some are worse. Ag mechanics, a lot of you do a lot of ag mechanics stuff in your classroom. Ag mechanics is horribly weak right now. It's probably the one division that's falling far behind everything else. Social was weak. Social's getting hard now. It's getting extremely hard. You have to have huge test areas. When we do a survey, if we don't have at least 100 responses, we don't consider it to be viable. There's not enough people there. So it kind of varies. Right now, Ag Mechanics is where we can really <coughs> jump in there. Um, project, um, project report template is required, not just suggested. I hated it when I go up there and an Oklahoma application come in front of me and immediately they drop 16 points because they hadn't used uh, the form that they needed to make sure they was the right spot, which will make more sense here in a little bit. But it is now required. Where to find it? FFA.org. Make sure you log in under your dashboard. Don't forget to do that. For whatever reason, half the stuff that we should be able to view is only available if you're logged in. So if you go to FFA.org and you only search AgriScience, it's going to come up with their page, and you're going to be like, there's nothing here. Log in, then it's there. Okay, so make sure you do that. Uh, project displays may not exceed 30. We talked about that. Very important. Let me tell you why they did that. They're trying to make this more standard with an actual national contest, actual AgriScience or research contest. They were seeing too much variety. They had a lot of problems up there. People would bring things they shouldn't. Um, and I can't think of any good examples right now, but uh, there was actual containers of chemicals being brought up there. You can't <coughs> have those there. Uh, that's why they took all the props away. It's now very standardized. It's not how well you can decorate your table. It's what's on that three by four board. I think it's a good change in my opinion. It's the boy from Georgia had a three foot I mean, excuse me, a four foot wide, but his board was nine feet tall. Exactly. Yeah. At one time, they were allowing it. Just absolutely huge. Uh, I'm definitely with Dr. Scott. You need to have a logbook. It says optional. Uh, you need to have a logbook at that table. Let me tell you why. Not that the judges are actually going to look at it, but they are doing a better job of getting more and more researchers that are judging that contest. And if you have somebody that makes their living doing research and they show up to a project and they walk over to your board and there's no log book, they're really going to question whether or not you did research at all or if you know what the meaning behind research is. So make sure you have one made up. Uh, they probably won't look at it, but you at least need to have one there. Also make sure you have a copy of your, your report. They say it's optional, but you might have a judge that really wants to read that report. Um, especially for like the boards that we do in Edmond. Our boards are not what you would call a uh, standard for agri-science research. They're dumbed down is what I call them. We put the fancy stuff and I stole ideas from people who were winning at nationals and threw the picture in the background so it looks pretty. We have pretty boards. They're not research boards. So if I have a researcher that's there that's judging one of our students they need to have that report to know that we're actually doing things right. So I definitely suggest having that. Um, a unique rubric, which we'll talk about. 
Okay, this is our the, their first attempt to fix a problem. Addition of skill development. That was their attempt to make sure whether or not it was actually good research being done. <coughs> the problem is they didn't stick many points to it. Uh, a problem that is still there is whether or not research projects are actually research projects. Are they actually only determining uh, the difference with one variable versus all kinds of different variables thrown together, and here's our conclusion. Um, but it is at least an attempt, it's a start. And then the pre-qualifying, or uh, also, I'm sorry, the grammar. Before there wasn't a good place to take grammar off, now there is. Okay, they've actually given that to you. <coughs> I cannot stress, and on this next page is just, I just printed that for you guys, and that is just so you have an idea of what there is there. Please make sure you're in the right division. Very important. And nationals, they will <coughs> not, they cannot. Um, they can't leave you in there if you don't belong there. There's too many kids competing, there's too much going on. It will di get disqualified by the time you get to nationals. You guys, just to add to that, if you have known that been disqualified, they made a few sentences into the abstract and literally threw it in the pile and said no. They didn't look at anything in it. Those first two sentences in the abstract yeah. said this is not in the right division and it was disqualified that fast. So you've got to make sure, ask all of us, ask state staff, email Jenna. She will help you and she will get an answer for you if you have any questions. The, uh, the first uh, rubric I wanted to look at was the new one. And I, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I'm an expert on it by no means because this is, uh, I just looked at it a week ago. It's my first time to look at it. But what I can tell you is this based off the old rubric. Number one, it's just like every other thing we've ever done as ag teachers. And that is when you get a rubric, and we have, a, we have a project or we have an activity that we've done and we want to see those kids get recognition in that area. We know the best thing we can do is go back to this rubric and you look at the high points category, no matter what our opinion is of a situation, we determine what it is from that square that achieves that student the high points. And that's all I can really tell you about the rubric on a national agri-science competition. When we go up there and we're judging, and you look at those 150 applications, especially after day one. After day one, you've got a solid eight hours in. Day two, you put 12 hours in of nonstop reading. After about 14 hours, we are only looking for these questions. Example importance, why is the topic important to the agriculture industry? You must establish to that person why it's important. If you don't do that, and if you don't do that in the first paragraph, you have not made it easy for that judge to read and evaluate. That has to be done. Um, what problem does the investigation solve for agriculture? Does it help? That, that's the biggest problem that we have. This is the first time I've really seen, does this research really have any bearing? The old rubric really didn't ask that question. And so, what we do before we even start a project is we start to do these sections so we know we're not going to waste our time. Does it meet those criteria? I would just add to that, guys, though. The way you write it up, okay, because it goes back to no research is bad research. It's how you write it up in the report. It may be something very simple, but you can find a benefit to agriculture from anything you do, okay? Just have to think about it a little bit. So, some of these things are good. They seem a little daunting. It's just about the language. Yeah, how you write it down. That's all it is. Others work. Those of you that done this before, that's essentially that's your literature review. Um, they they kind of pulled some things out. They changed it. It's no longer introduction. It's no longer literature review. They they made it a little bit clearer and easier for the student to be able to answer that question. Materials and methods, um, it, it's really the same on both sides, except for on the little kids, seventh and eighth graders, or I guess eighth graders for us, you're no longer going to lose 16 points for not putting the hypothesis inside of the materials and methods page. And that's what you lost before. 
So they actually have a separate section for that. Uh, they're still next to each other, but the materials and methods, essentially the idea behind that is it's very important, very, very important. Well, let me back up. Any of these science research projects, when you write the report, you should not use the word I, we, the ag teacher, grandma, mom, <coughs> that it's not written that way. It's written as the instructions on how to install your VCR. Okay? The guy that wrote those instructions didn't say, I put this container, this cable to this location. It shows you, it tells you, that's it. If there's anything like that, the only place you can have that is in the acknowledgments. I acknowledge that my ag teacher helped me and lots of other people, thank you very much. And that's as simple as the acknowledgments page really has to be. Every other portion of it should be written from the perspective of, I want to replicate this. Somebody else has to be able to replicate what I've done. The materials and methods should be written that way. Like an example, the fertilizer was applied by mixing you know, fertilizer with water solution and then applied topically to the plants. Not we did it, I did right. it, anything like that. It's just a definitive statement, this was done. Yeah, it has to, and the materials and methods, they will mark off for you if you don't do that. Uh, results is uh, the actual results, but don't draw any conclusions there. In other words, it's, uh, uh, you're looking mostly at data or things that are actually observed, I believe is how it's stated. It's what is actually observed at that point. Make sure on your tables and figures that you use APA style. We didn't do that for years, and finally I, I, I figured out that I wasn't doing what I needed to do. Just go on the internet, Google APA figure, and uh, they will show you exactly how to lay that out. It's very simple. You just have to know where to put everything, how to put it in there. But if you do not have a table in the results section, you lost another 16 points. I don't know if that's true with the new rubric, but it's a huge hit. You have to have that information in there. Uh, also, results, if you're doing your statistical analysis, that goes in there as well, I believe. Then you have discussion, conclusion, summary. I'll kind of let you guys look at this on your own. Those are the big ones that I see problems at judging the written reports. Uh, nationals is just putting things in the wrong place. Not that we're doing it wrong. The difference in a good paper and a bad paper is only about, unless you put something in the wrong place, is only about 15 to 20 points. The written report is only worth what percent of the total score? 33, 40? 33. 33% or something in that neighborhood. It's really all at nationals is where you're going to win it or lose it. Mm -hmm. So if you write the written report in the correct order, you're going to be okay. Oklahoma will get out. If it goes there and it's not a disqualifier, if it was, if it was written in the right order, Oklahoma applications at this point will get out. Now it's continuing to get harder and harder, but at this point, I think we'll be okay. Um, and just just to make sure everybody knows that that <clears throat> excuse me the pre pre qualification to get to that top twelve, they never see the kid. It's just like everything else. It's the report mm -hmm. period, and they either keep or call you. You're in the top twelve or you're out. You get invited or not. So that report has to be written to that rubric, so the questions are there, just kind of like National Chapter App. You've got to go through and check the boxes. Did I put this in here? Did I put this where it belongs? Does it go there? Because like you said, when you've got 150, it's real easy just to go, can't check the box, can't check the box, can't check the box. This one didn't go in. So, check the box. I'm going to skip forward a little bit. We're running a little bit lower on time, and I want to look at uh, pre-qualifying rubrics of grades 9 through 12. Those of you that have done average science fair projects before, the nothing has changed except they added those two things at the end. And that is that they added the skill development and the APA style spelling. So even if you're not a very good speller, or your grammar's not very good, you're still only going to lose five points, okay? They didn't hit you hard. And even on the skill development, they're only gonna hit you five points. But when you only have a variation of 15 or 20 points from application number one down to application number 15, those can add up. 
Okay, so they're still important, but as long as you get the other parts, you should be okay. How are they determining skill development? I can't answer that question, to tell you the truth. I cannot answer that question yet. I haven't looked at the new app, uh, the new template to tell you if it's actually a section. I think it's probably not. I, it's incorporated. It's going to be one yes. of those. As a result, I have developed this. That's one of those personalization places that you will be able to say, as a researcher in doing this project, I have developed the following skills based on what I accomplished in the project. And I think if, don't quote me on those exact words, but I think if you get a statement or two in there like that that are valid, that they can go, oh yeah, I can see how that skill comes from this. So that skill comes from this. If they see that, I think you'll be able to check the box. And where would you put that? I'd probably put it in conclusions, me personally, because that's where I've wrapped everything up. But I'm going to go find to comment. If that was a lie, I'll call you. <laughs> so I think that's probably right. That sounds correct. That's how I read it and understood it, but I have been wrong on case. Uh, the next part, just real quick, is the uh, the interview section at Nationals. So you get to Nationals, and that, that's where a lot of your points come in. Uh, I have had the opportunity to be on the National Committee, committee for the past three. This is my third year now, and I've learned a lot. And uh, two years ago, I, I still remember this, uh, we were in the Social Systems Division, and uh, our kids got beat by another group that they had read a story or had a kid read a passage, six of them while a horse was watching, six of them when a horse was not watching. And they found that the people read better whenever there was a horse around. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Uh, it bothered me at the time, I didn't understand. I, I didn't understand how from only 12 people you could beat somebody that had a test group of a hundred and something. And I thought, well, we've got bad judges. It's, it's just not right. And then finally, I got past myself and I thought to myself, well, what can I do to make the students better, more prepared? And I uh, was sitting there uh, making sure all the judges had filled in their scantrons right. Wonderful job. It's absolutely horrible. But that was my job that particular day to make sure they were all dotted in. We're stressed when we're doing Read, this reading, this <laughs> reading that Scantron, and I realized that they give you exactly what you need to do in order to win the interview process. And the second year we went up there, the year after getting beat by the horses, um, I, I told the students to do this. I said, you start off your presentation by establishing the project. You talk about the important stuff. Why was this important? Why did I come up with, or how this question come into play? What is the importance of it? What was my hypothesis? And then literally, they told that you're allowed 15 minutes. I told them to talk for 10 to 12 minutes, and I want you to go line by line down that rubric and memorize statements to make sure that you get full credit on every single level of that rubric. We got our results back um, off that declarations page. Uh, our interview scores have never been higher. I did not give the judges an opportunity to knock points off. I tried to make it very clear that these things were all accomplished, that we had addressed every single issue. Uh, I think you had a question about teamwork earlier. That's actually on the interview <coughs> rubric. And they talked about what were their duties throughout the process during the interview process. And that made a big difference for us, is we actually talked to, I know the first year I ever went to Nationals told the kids to do a two minute intro, we were terrible. Placed absolutely horribly. The longer they have talked, the higher they've gone up. Because sometimes you get judges that just, they might just be sponsors and they don't know anything about animals or anything. <coughs> so, any questions? Jeremy, did they follow that same concept with the state contest? You talked about the national. I mean, does it does it take a different deal at state 
you know, you got to get past state to get the national. I haven't figured that one out yet. Okay. Working on it. Okay. I, I think it varies. Hey, you know, the state uh, state contest. Yeah, I think they do. I think they, that's their intention, and they created a rubric uh, last year that we could follow. And I think that uh, that is essentially where they're going as well. Um, so yes, yeah, yeah. Is there time if if you win state and you're going on? Is there a time to uh, maybe take care of some of those problems before they send them on to nationals? Like if you have grammar yeah. problems, that kind of thing. Yeah. I'm just, just asking. Yeah, we've got about uh, at least a month, maybe longer. It's a while. So. <coughs> I'll, I'll point out too one problem we've had is no data to be entered after your state qualifying event. Now you're just pretty close to when you send them us, but we have some states that are qualifying events in like March and the teachers and the kids want to go in and put in extra data. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a no no. Yeah. So don't be doing that. But you can clean it up for things. And then because some of the areas aren't quite as competitive yet as some Sometimes we take all the applications we're sent, and so preparing a young person who this might be their first time to ever be in an event like that, I always tell the kids, have your log book because you can refer to it if you need to when the judges are talking to you because they might not be quite as polished as your kids and they get nervous and they forget what they want to say. Sometimes that log book can really come in handy for a kid to help them, especially with their report copy with them too. So that helps. We want them to have a good experience and come back. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? Everybody just on this. <laughs> I might I might add too on the due date. That written report is due April third. And so talking about having that thirty days prior to you guys really have to, if you're going to do something this year, you've really got to get started on it because you really technically only have January and February to do your to do the project and get things analyzed because then after OYE, you've only got about a week to 10 days to turn a written report in for the state contest April 3rd. And so it's it's not when interscholastics is, it's, it's about it's before that so you really have to you really got to have a lot of your legwork done before oklahoma city <coughs> comes around to, to be competitive at state we're sitting in the hog barn and edit papers yes you know, I, i'll tell you too there's you know you see some things i noticed the other night brett when, when we were looking at you notice the pilgrim's pride mm -hmm. if you notice when they're advertising chickens that they're advertised. I can't. I can't even think of the product. I asked Kurt a while ago. It's a natural product that all of us don't even think about. Uh, that they're feeding their chickens to to sit there and they say that's what they're doing to take the place of antibiotics. Uh, yes, it is right. They're they're feeding oregano to their chickens to control. Uh, guys, there's all kinds of people that now are feeding essential oils to animals to see if it, it, it decreases parasites in them. I mean, there's there's a million things that would be possible for your students to do. I really appreciate these two guys coming. They shared everything with you. I will also tell you that, guys, I think both of them will continue to do that at, that answer any questions that you'll have. This is an important step for us. Again, guys, just to emphasize science to our students. I think that's very important. Uh, I think that's really a good thing. Hey, real quick, uh, it was brought to my attention. If you do projects on animals, there is a form that you have to fill out on national. You you have to abide by FDA rules. You can't just start feeding them something that's not approved for those animals. There's a form to fill out that you've got to fill out. No man, no animals were hurt during the filming of this show. <laughs> actually, Mr. Murray, there are actually several forms. Hazardous materials. Yeah food products. There, at the national application, there are several things that yeah. we have to fill out and sign up. Uh, I use the names of specific products that we use. I mean, it's not, you know, it's, I've never gotten in trouble for it. Because, you know, we use specific names. Now, when you're running, like, food-based surveys and food-based, uh, like, uh, questionnaires, do you have to have a consent form from that person before you can start your survey? We do at my school. We run it all like we if anything we cook or anything like that that we do survey data on, 
We could get in. It's not home ec anymore. I'm sorry. Family consumer science. Yeah, don't get that wrong. I'm too old. Family consumer science. We cook it in their classrooms, and everybody that comes to do the survey data does sign a consent form. Then they, because that's part of it's required. Did you have consent to do this? And then do you have to submit those, those consent forms? I've never been. I've never submitted them. I've never been asked for them, other than from my superintendent and the administration of my school. Yeah, and that's a CYA. We all know that. They want to make sure they were covered. So, so I keep them in files. I still have them from four years ago. They're there in case anybody comes to ask. We did have their. They knew what they were doing. Yeah. Any questions? Any more? These guys went two minutes over. Uh, let's or three minutes now. Let's give them a round of applause.